Greetings! This is part 2 of creating a sauce-like camera behavior with Godot. In previous video I discussed free camera mode for camera which is following but is also controllable. In this video I'll show how to create a target locking system on top of this camera. I also will show a way to use better designing practices which aren't necessary but are helping with supportability of your project. Short version. Have a hotkey for target locking, have a target, if player presses target lock, change look at variable in camera script to target's position. Done. Like it, subscribe, please. Now, how to actually do it right? First, we need some preparations. Our camera starts to have two fundamentally different behaviors. This leads to a first string of update function being the branching operator, and that's a sign of something going wrong. Instead, let's create camera behavior mention to some state scripts and just call current state in all updates and inputs. This way your code becomes more readable as different states use different camera parameters and are shorter files. Your code also becomes more scalable as you aren't limited to two behaviors and can modify them separately. To implement this practice, create a base camera state class script and think of key controls you want to use in each state. For my example, each state needs to have an update function that being called each frame. Each state then needs to react to player inputs such as mouse movement and target lock and hotkey. I also want to free my mouse often to maybe use some interface controls or manipulate the editor in runtime. Create shells for these functions and pass lock them. The base state doesn't do shit and all functionality will be implemented in its airs. Then navigate to project setting and bind a key to lock target. Now commit a small holy portion your base camera script, then the survivors are a bunch of internal variables for our children delegates to use and a couple of short functions. In these functions all we do is we delegate update and input processing to our current state. Create two children nodes of a simple node type, create their scripts and make sure you extend camera state. Call this node something like free and locked. Then just navigate to a base camera state, copy all the code you have there and pass it to a new state script. You now quotes implemented an interface of a camera state and have a bunch of functions to overwrite. The next step is to populate the state of free camera with code you had in your main camera script. Update behavior goes to update, mouse input goes to mouse input behavior. Your code now has new structure and old implementations. This is the perfect point to stop and make sure you refactor without the functionality loss. Build your project and check if your free camera works as intended. Debug it and only then continue to add functionality. Now let's talk about target locking. There are two key topics, how to find a target to lock and how to lock it. You first need to find a single ideal target to lock, then you just make your camera focus point follow the target instead of player's chest. And then you move to a different update cycle to regulate camera position and ignore user mouse inputs. When free in camera all you need to do is to forget your target, follow player's chest again and move to free camera update cycle. In terms of state machine, all you need to do is to set up correct information for your locked camera state and then just switch to it. Considering the target finding, first you need all targetable entities to be in one group, then you choose one of them somehow. One can think of like 20 algorithms of navigating across this collection of entities in 3D. I will shortly list several I think of from easier to more difficult. The easiest is just to use camera's built-in is in frustrum function. The better one is to use camera's unproject position on possible target position and show it into some inequality, like circular or ellipsoid mask in the center of the screen. Next are non-screen methods like selecting the enemy which is closest to player or to some point in front of the player's face or to a line, being it a line from player's face forward or a line from camera in the camera side direction. What method to choose depends on your laziness and the number of dimensions you use in your game. I use a simple Eason Frustrum now and will move to an ellipsoid later as I am exploring a concept of fencing game that is practically a 2D game in a 3D world. If you are working on highly vertical shooter or even something truly 3D like Cosmo fighting, you will need to implement better target selection algorithm. Now let's talk about grouping your targets. You can do it as simple as adding the group to your enemies by hands in the editor, but this is not the way. The nicest design I can think of is to create a separate scene and call it like targetable aspect. In this scene you can set up all the work you do around targeting to a certain entity. For example, 
I have a point to lock on here, but I also have a target marker position, and of course this scene contains a simple script that puts it into targetable group on creation. The magic is, you can now just put this aspect into any entity you want to be targetable, be it an enemy, an object, or even a part of some giant enemy which has several focusable parts in his body. If you want to forward customize it, you can make the aspect local and process the target marker or the focus point as the time passes. Now, as we successfully selected our target and did a state switch, what do we actually do? Firstly, I already did show this code in the previous video, but only now it will get sense. When camera is free, player orbits it and goes from it when forward movement is inputted. When camera is focused on the target, player orbits the target and forward starts to be towards that target. This means the targeting operation flips your input axis. And we need to address it in our code by multiplying our inputs by minus one when camera is targeted. Secondly. Target locking takes user's ability to rotate their camera. The function of mouse input is straight up useless, you don't even implement it in this state, just delete it. All we do in locked state is we are trying to position our camera in a way it keeps the player between camera nest and the target. The top layer is identical to the free camera state. We adjust focus point, then camera nest, then camera position and line of sight. The difference is in offset rotation function. What it does is it simply counts the direction from target to player, then builds the new offset vector with this direction from the ground up, changing its x and z coordinates and saving its y coordinate. The last function is checking if the distance between the player and target is too big and drops the target if triggered. Talking about target dropping, all we do is setting up the free camera state and passing this process priority to it. The offset reassignment is to avoid the camera leap, as the last offset free camera remembers is the offset when it passed the priority to the locked state. And the Chevskis will be eliminating all the magic numbers. All the lurping weights in the following code, the target dropping distance, all numbers need to become constants at the top of state code. The camera is done, the core video is over, but I want to give a couple of examples and pipelines of how you can further work with states to develop new features. First, you need to ask yourself if you need another state. For example, you want a feature of cycling through targets when locked, like in a targeting MMO. You only use pre-existing locked state, so you only need to add new functionality there. Add a new shell function in camera state script, then make a delegate call to this function in the main camera script as a reaction to input. Then implement this function in your locked state. Another example, if you need a completely separate camera state, maybe a cutscene camera rail or maybe a long arm view from the top tactical camera like in a Dragon Age series. First, you create a new camera state here and a corresponding node child in your camera. Then you modify the base camera state to have a function to switch. Then you add this user input into your main script. And then you code the bridges for switching between the newly added state and two pre-existing ones. 